One of the things that impressed me most about WandaVision is the show's undulating sense of dread. Often within the space of a single scene, the series manages to mutate from silly, to charming, to gut-wrenchingly sad, but the one constant is dread. The creeping terror of something amiss, the slow weakening of Wanda's grip on reality, and the unwilling inhabitants who haunt the uncanny world of Westview like ghosts. Stark White Suburbia as a source of horror is nothing new, of course. From Ira Levin's 1972 book The Stepford Wives, to Peter Weir's 1998 film The Truman Show, and Jordan Peele's award-winning directorial debut Get Out from 2017, all present the suffocating, suspended animation of life in the suburbs, the placation and phony ideals of middle-class America. And it's in this way that the facade of Westview, both as a paradigm of white picket fence neighbourhoods and as a literal construct of Wanda's own imagination, becomes a reflection of Vision's own artificiality. In the tradition of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the Vision is a perversion of humanity, a watermelon-coloured man-made man, and it's on these principles of horror that the supernatural synthesoid was first introduced in the pages of Marvel Comics. Hey heroes, I'm Josh from Panels to Pixels, and this is the true horror of Vision's comic book origin. Vision was created by Roy Thomas and John Buscema, and first appeared in Avengers issue 57, cover dated October 1968. Just looking at this cover art gives you an idea of what to expect from the character's debut. The terrified Avengers cower beneath a super-sized spectre. Reaching out from plumes of smoke, the Vision is cast in a blood-red light. This moody monochromatic cover signifies danger, terror and death. Even the credits for Revengers issue 57 promise, quote, an eerie expedition into unexplored realms. And that's exactly what we get. Flipping over the page and there is an argument to be made that this is the best comic book opener ever put to print. It's the setting of so many film noir thrillers. A mysterious cloaked figure walks against a rainy, moonless, cloud-draped sky. Except in this comic, the Vision doesn't walk, or stroll, or mosey, he stalks. In this cinematic introduction, everything we are shown and told about the character signals Vision as a villain. He creeps into the apartment window of an unsuspecting Janet Van Dyne, otherwise known as the Wasp. As he stands at the terrace door, Vision is cast in shadow, and his silhouette evokes countless on-screen depictions of Dracula. The raised collar of his cape obscures his features, but his white eyes pierce the darkness. Your time has come, Janet Van Dyne, and there is nothing you can do to stay your fate. No, no! It's some sort of unearthly vision. And that voice, like something from beyond the grave. The language of horror is clearly at play in this introduction to the character. Vision phases through walls and locked doors as a ghost, and there are multiple allusions to death and the supernatural. And look, if it seems like I'm overhyping this comic a little bit, well, I'm sorry, but it really is just so good. John Buscema's pencils in this issue are as filmic and dynamic as it ever got in the Silver Age, while Inca George Klein's bold line work is suitably moody and atmospheric. In a sea of middling Avengers stories from the 1960s and 70s, Behold the Vision stands out to me as one of the high watermarks for the title, and it was born out of one simple question. What if I brought back the Vision from the old comics? That was the proposal set out by writer Roy Thomas to Avengers co-creator and then series editor Stan Lee, to which Lee responded, no. Instead, Stan the Man requested that Thomas and Buscema introduce an android character to the ranks of Earth's Mightiest Heroes. I never asked him why, explains Roy Thomas. He didn't care what I did as long as it was an android, so I made up an android and called him The Vision, and he looked a lot like the old one. The old Vision in question was a Golden Age character from the 1940s, and was first introduced in Marvel Mystery Comics issue 13. Created by Jack Kirby and Joe Simon, this Vision, also known as Arcus, is an interdimensional apparition who freezes evildoers with the touch of his hand. Though he ultimately fights for justice as one of the good guys, Arcus's introduction as a visitor from the supernatural smoke world, accessed via, quote, some sort of scientific seance, undoubtedly blurs the line between horror and heroism. And it was this idea of the Vision as a kind of spooky and heroically ambiguous figure that Roy Thomas sought to bring forward into the modern day Marvel universe, much to the chagrin of Stan Lee. As Thomas himself explains, I don't think he ever thought the Vision was a really strong name. It seems a little wimpy, but I felt Vision, it really means like a ghost or a mirage or an image. A 
As Avengers 57 continues, horror gives way to science fiction. As we learn that the Vision is not some evil spirit or freakish phantom as initially suspected, but a synthesoid. He is, as Hank Pym explains to the other heroes, every inch a human being, except that all his bodily organs are constructed of synthetic materials. We soon discover that he has been sent to defeat the Avengers by his robot creator, Ultron 5. But upon returning to Ultron's secret lair, the Vision makes a heel turn and teams up with Earth's mightiest heroes to meet his mechanical maker. It ultimately becomes a story about finding humanity in the inhuman. Vision earns the Avengers' trust by exposing his emotional vulnerability and laying his life on the line for the humans. Meanwhile, the subjugated synth overthrows his maniacal machine master by exploiting Ultron's own human fallibilities. Pride, arrogance, rage, and vengeance. In creating Vision, Roy Thomas was heavily inspired by fellow comic book writer Otto Binder who in 1939 had published a science fiction short story titled I, Robot. Confusingly, this isn't the better known 1950 book by Isaac Asimov that inspired the Will Smith film of the same name, but we'll get onto that one in a second. In Binder's story, a robot with artificial intelligence and feelings called Adam is vilified after the accidental death of his human creator and provoked into retaliating by a mob of armed men. iRobot subverts the 1930s Frankenstein trope of an evil robot turning against his master for no reason by presenting Adam as a sympathetic and misunderstood protagonist. And it was this element that Roy Thomas sought to emulate with his creative vision. And speaking of creative vision, unlock yours with Skillshare. Absolutely flawless transition there. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people like you. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and most importantly, get inspired. There are literally thousands of classes on there from illustration, graphic design, animation, video editing, photography, music, and so much more. Recently, I've been getting really into toy and action figure photography because I'm a massive dweeb apparently, but the truth is I'm a very amateur photographer. So I just went straight to Skillshare and I brushed up on the fundamentals of DSLR photography with Justin Bridges. This crash course gives you everything you need to know about all that confusing stuff like shutter speed, aperture and ISO, so that you can take the stunning professional photos you've always dreamed of. What I really love about Skillshare is the combination of video lessons, which are great for visual learners like me, plus the class projects that encourage you to get creative and put your new skills into practice. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes, so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And the best part is it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. But even better than that, for a limited time only, the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below will get a free trial of premium membership. So whether you're a beginner, a pro, a dabbler or a master, Skillshare has the tools you need to explore your creativity. Thanks, on with the show. Isaac Asimov, science fiction writer and noted biochemist, is the author behind that other iRobot, you know, the much more famous one that became a $100 million Converse commercial. Asimov's collection of short stories was in fact inspired by Binder's earlier work, but the name was chosen by the publisher against the author's wishes. If you're not familiar with his work, Isaac Asimov quite literally wrote the book on robotics, introducing the word to the English language and devising his three laws of robotics. These rules form a unifying theme in much of the writer's stories, which dealt with the paternal relationship between man and machine, and uses humanity's treatment of robots as an allegory of social oppression. As part of his apparent advocacy for machine ethics, the author coined the term Frankenstein complex, referring to man's irrational and prejudicial fear of robots. In Asimov's prophetic robot stories, the science fiction author predicts that the fear and suspicion of mechanical men would become stronger and more widespread the closer they got to resembling human beings. Which brings us to... We've all experienced life in the Uncanny Valley at some point. It's that feeling of eeriness we experience when we see a realistic humanoid or CGI person that is almost human, but something about them is just off. The valley itself refers to the dip in human affinity towards a robot, 3D model or lifelike doll the closer they get to human likeness. In other words, it's why we find cartoony Pixar characters absolutely adorable, but we get freaked the F out by fake Luke Skywalker in The Mandalorian. Oh God, it's happening again. A research study from 2011 found that when subjects were shown footage of a real human performing actions like waving, nodding, and taking a drink of water, and then shown footage of a mechanical robot performing the same actions, they showed very typical brain responses. But when presented with a lifelike android performing these actions, the subject's brains lit up like a Christmas tree. 
The study suggests that our brains can't compute the incongruity between an android's human-like appearance and its robotic movements and mannerisms. This conflict between man and machine, human and inhuman, and the emotional distress it can trigger in our primitive monkey brains has formed the basis of countless sci-fi and horror stories. And this is something that gets played with a lot in Vision's comic book origin. In his first two comic book appearances, the other Avengers frequently remark on the android's cold tone and dispassionate demeanor. It's something that causes the other heroes some discomfort and makes for an interesting team dynamic once Vision becomes an official member. Many issues later, when the Vision and Scarlet Witch forge a romantic relationship, some of their fellow Avengers object to the unusual pairing. In Avengers issue 110, Wanda's brother Quicksilver even goes so far as to say, no sister of mine may become involved with a, a, a robot. The fear of the otherness surrounding Vision only increases as the series progresses. And with the reveal that the synthesoid was created by Ultron using the electronically preserved brain patterns of the deceased Wonder Man and the android body of the original Human Torch, writers like Roy Thomas and Steve Englehart further mine the familiar Frankenstein mythos. Vision spends a lot of time in his early appearances dwelling on the fact that he has human thoughts and feelings but is trapped in a synthetic body, the prospect of which has its own body horror implications of corporeal imprisonment. Writer Tom King would later take the horror elements of the Android Avengers story to its logical conclusion in his 2016 modern classic Vision, the suburban setting of which partly forms the basis of WandaVision. In this 12-issue series, Vision's attempts to live what he thinks is a normal human life only alienates him further from society, the Avengers, and even his own family. And for what it's worth, I actually think the Marvel Cinematic Universe does a really good job at adapting Vision's introduction from the comics. Despite its many flaws, including the fact that it was directed by a man who is, by most accounts, a total f**kwit, 2015's Avengers Age of Ultron captures the eerie unearthliness of the android's origin and recontextualizes it as a moment ripped straight from a classic monster movie. The only thing missing is a mad scientist shouting, It's alive! It's alive! And while I feel the character has been kind of underutilized in the movie since then, it's been really great to see him placed back in a supernatural setting thanks to WandaVision. But at the end of the day, in terms of sheer spookiness and eldritch atmosphere, nothing even comes close to the Vision's extraordinary comic book introduction in Avengers issue 57. Thanks for watching this video. If you want to see more stuff like this, then make sure to subscribe to Panels to Pixels and hit the bell icon to get notified whenever I put out a new video. Thanks also to those who support the channel on Patreon over at patreon.com slash panels to pixels. If you enjoyed this video about spooky superhero shenanigans, I recommend checking out a video I previously made called The Body Horror of Superheroes. Alternatively, you can check out my most recent video all about 15 Marvel Comics characters who are based on real people. Until we meet again, heroes, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.